Hi, I'm Jim from the Wyoming State Museum, and today we're going to be looking at the museum's Yellowstone Touring Wagon. This wagon has a really interesting history, and some of it we didn't even know about until we had some conservation work done on the wagon a couple of years ago. Um, so, how did this wagon come to be in the collections of the Wyoming State Museum? Well, back in 1969, there was a curator from the museum who was in Laramie, Wyoming, and he saw this wagon, not in its current state, he saw this wagon in a very dilapidated state, sitting on the grounds of the Union Pacific Railroad Depot in that town, in the town of Laramie. Um, as I said, it was, in, it was in pretty bad shape. It had been coated in many, many layers of paint, uh, gold and brown paint, which, which reflect the colors of the University of Wyoming. But no one knew how the wagon got to the grounds of the Union Pacific Railroad Depot. No one knew its history. They just knew that it had been there for decades. And as I said, being exposed to the elements, it was in a, in a pretty bad state of decay. And it had also been used by local children in the neighborhood around the depot as a plaything for, like I say, decades. So the curator knew that this style of wagon had been used to tour Yellowstone National Park back in the 1800s, late 1800s, and into the early 1900s. And as I said, he approached the director of the Union Pacific Railroad Depot and said, hey, would it be possible for us to have this transferred to the Wyoming State Museum so that we can preserve it and then hopefully we can find some money to help bring it back to some of its former glory. Well it was transferred in 1970 but the getting the funds to bring it back to its former glory didn't happen for about 40 years and just a few years ago the museum got some money from the Wyoming State Legislature to conserve specific objects. We also got some grant money from the uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Foundation, the the um, Greenwood Foundation down in Denver, and also the Wyoming Cultural Trust and the Wyoming State Museum Volunteers. All these organizations kicked in to see about getting this, this wagon to the point where it could be put on display and used to interpret early Wyoming tourism. So in this photograph, you can see what the wagon looked like essentially when it came to the museum back in the 1970s, or back in 1970. There was, as, as I said, this, this very thick golden brown paint, which at the end of the day, it looks hideous here, but it was at the end of the day, it was a, it was a real uh, blessing in disguise for the, for the wagon itself, and I'll get to that in a minute. So the wagon was sent off to a company that has done wagon restoration on a number of different vehicles related to the Yellowstone tourist trade. Uh, they're very knowledgeable about this type of wagon, how it was put together, and so on. Uh, the original idea was to have the wagon, what was left of the paint on the wagon, this, this brown and gold paint, that was to be stripped off. The wagon was to be repainted in a livery that was similar to the way it would have looked in 1905. And then we could have used that to talk about the Yellowstone tourist trade around 1905. But I got a phone call uh, not long after the wagon had departed up for the uh, facility in South Dakota that was doing the work. And they said, hey, we wanted you to know that we were doing some test sanding and we have found a lot of the original factory paint of the wagon underneath these later coats of paint. Eight total coats of paint had been put on top of this original, this original uh, factory paint. They said, what do you want us to do? And I thought, well, there's no way that I can let that original factory paint be sanded off uh, at this stage. I've, I've got to find a way to, to fund this. So a few grant a few grants uh, later, we managed to come up with the money to have the entire wagon disassembled and hand sanded down to the original factory paint. But when this project was going on, not only did we find out interesting things uh, that were related to the original factory paint, which I'll show you here in a second, uh, we also found some interesting, um, some interesting secrets in the wagon or on the wagon that we wouldn't, have been, we wouldn't have known about if we had not gone and had this conservation work done in the first place. But before we get into that, uh, let's take a look at how this wagon was actually used back in, let's say, 1895, 1896. So it was possible back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, for anyone to go and tour Yellowstone National Park. There are records of people going through on wagons, on horseback. There are even people who went through the park uh, on bicycles. But one of the things that the Northern Pacific Railroad thought would be a good idea is to cater to the upper classes, people who had wealth and, and money. They wanted them to uh, be wanting to make the trip out to Yellowstone National Park and on their, on their railroads. And so they, they put together a package deal. And what you could do is you could buy 
uh, from one of the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, stations, you could buy a ticket from any place in the United States. Uh, let's say you wanted to go from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You could buy a ticket from Pittsburgh to Livingston, Montana, which was up uh, just north of Yellowstone National Park. The train would then take you down to Cinnabar. Uh, we're talking about 1895, so they would take you down to the, to the town of Cinnabar, which is essentially where Gardner, Montana is right now. Uh, they would drop you off there. Then you would get on a large wagon, which would take you to Mammoth Hot Springs. Now, the railroad had also subsidized the construction of some really high-end hotels around Yellowstone National Park. So if you look at this map, this is a map of Yellowstone National Park here. And you can see here at the north end, this is the route that you would have taken back in the mid-1890s to tour Yellowstone National Park. You would take your train to Livingston, which would be up here. You would come down here to Mammoth Hot Springs. Then from Mammoth Hot Springs, you would board a wagon like the one that we're examining today, and you would, I'll use the shadow of my finger, no, here we go, this will work. You would go from Mammoth Hot Springs, touring down through here, across to Fountain Hotel, which was a high-end hotel that was, it was heated by uh, water that was piped out of one of the local hot springs, and the walls were painted with some of the different colored mud from the surrounding area. Then you would make your way down here to the area around Old Faithful. This is 1895, so it's before the construction of the Old Faithful Inn. You would tour the Geyser Basin here. Then you would make your way back to Fountain Hotel and stay there. The next day you would go along here along the north shore of Yellowstone Lake to stay at Lake Hotel, which is still in existence. Then you would make your way up here the next day to Canyon Hotel and you would stay at Canyon. Canyon Hotel is no longer in existence. And then you would make your way back on the route that you came to Mammoth Hot Springs. You would stay a night there. You would get back on the train and go back to whatever city you had, you had come from in the first place. Now, to give you an idea of some of the hotels that people were staying at, this is a really nice image of the Mammoth Hot Springs Hotel. There's a little sliver of an extension of the Mammoth Hot Springs Hotel that still exists and is tied into one of the hotels in Mammoth Hot Springs today. But this original hotel is long gone. This hotel is Fountain Hotel. And this is the one that, as I said, was heated with water from the local hot springs. Now down here we have the Old Faithful Inn. The Old Faithful Inn was not built until after 1900. Um, but there were hotels and places to stay around the Old Faithful Inn, around the Old Faithful at the time. But what you would usually do in the 1890s was you would go and visit the geysers around the Old Faithful area, and then you'd make your way back to Fountain Hotel to spend the night there and then the next day you would make your way over to lake hotel which is still in existence and it's a beautiful hotel if you get the chance to stay there or even even if you're passing by it in yellowstone national park i highly recommend going there just to see it and then you would go up and stay at canyon hotel but then you would make your way from canyon hotel back to mammoth hot springs hotel you would get on your on your train and head out but the key, the linchpin to this entire system was the Yellowstone Touring Wagon. And at any one time in the 1890s all the way up into, up, all the way up through 1916, as many as 100 of these wagons would be on the road in Yellowstone during the course of a day. And the people who were riding in these wagons, again, were folks from the upper classes who had the money to be able to afford to do this. As I mentioned, you would buy this package deal from the Northern Pacific Railroad. They would take you to Yellowstone. You would have a, essentially a five-day tour of the park on one of these wagons before you went back home. Uh, one of the interesting parts about this whole system is that the tour guide for your journey through Yellowstone National Park at the time was your wagon driver. And we'll see something that reflects a little bit of that on the wagon here in just a second. So while touring the park, you would have high-end dinners. You would be entertained by string quartets. And some of the dinners, by the way, were uh, actually uh, created by f uh, chefs brought over from Europe. The accommodations themselves were actually quite luxurious for, for the time. And this wagon, this observation wagon, afforded what was probably the best experience for being able to see the wonders of Yellowstone National Park. During the course of your five days touring the park, you would stop at high-end lunch stations 
where they would serve champagne and things like that. Um, it was, it was, a, it was a, an experience for the wealthy. And the wealthy, when they came west to see Yellowstone National Park, they wanted that wilderness experience, but they also wanted to have soft pillows at the end of the day. And something must have worked quite well because this system was in place from the very early 1890s all the way up, into, up until uh, 1916. Now, during the conservation process, the people who were sanding down the wagon came across the paint job of two different companies. The first one that they came down to, which, was, which would have been later, of course, in the evolution of the wagon, the first one that they came down to was the Yellowstone Park Transportation Company. That was the, the title that was on the side of the wagon. And it was very poorly applied. It had been done in a very thin layer of paint. Uh, it actually kind of flaked off as soon as they got down to that layer. Uh, so the decision was made at that point in time to take that layer off and go down to the original paint job that could be seen uh, from the work that they had done already. They knew it was there and the decision was made uh, to go down to that, that original factory paint job. And that's when we got down to the Yellowstone National Park Transportation Company uh, logo. And then if you look over here, you'll see that that original factory number for this wagon was number 99. And if you look down here, you can see what's left of the Abbott Downing Company cartouche. Again, Abbott Downing being the company that made the wagon in the first place. But some of the other surprises that came out on this wagon as the conservation process continued, and I apologize for the glare of the light that I'm using over here, but you can see the original pinstriping on the wagon. You can also see it here on the lever here. And then if you go down to the undercarriage of the wagon, you can see a lot of the pinstriping, a lot of the original pinstriping down here still remains on the wagon wheel or on the, the wagon axles themselves, on the wagon wheels. And there's some more interesting things right here. That part that looks like a possibly a dead rat back there is actually a really interesting piece of history. But first, let's look over here. One of the interesting things that was found was the serial number for this wagon, 22374. And even more so, stamped into this metal cross piece here is the name of the blacksmith who worked at Abbott Downing that was in charge of creating this wagon. His name was J.A. Gervais. And with a little bit of research, we managed to find a photograph of Mr. Gervais. And he worked for the Abbott Downing Company until he was 74 years old. Uh, and he was getting paid a really good chunk of money to, to work for Abbott Downing to create these wagons. When the average uh, salary for, monthly salary for a blacksmith was about $65. Mr. Gervais was getting, I believe it was two, about $220 a month. So he was making almost four times as much as your average blacksmith was to make these wagons for Abbott Downing. Some other interesting things that we've discovered here. If you look over here on this side, and I'm sorry that this is upside down, you can see the original serial number for the wa of the wagon is actually been stenciled onto the wagon wheel itself. And then if you look over here, this is really hard to make out at this angle and in this light, but you can see if you look at it from the other side, if, you, if we were to go to the other side of the wheel and look down at this, but I can't do it because of the, the angle that I would be at, this word right here is nigh, N-I-G-H. And if you look at the wagon over the wheel over here, let's see if I can actually find it. I'm going to have to crawl down underneath the wagon in order to see this. If you look right here, you can see stenciled on the word off for a long period of time. It, comes, it dates back to, I believe, when people first were leading oxen and carts. And you would always lead an oxen from the left side, the front left side of the cart. And that was known as the nigh side or the near side. And the right side of the wagon was known as the off side. So these wagon wheels are both um, imprinted with nigh on the left side wheels and off on the right side wheels. 
so, the th so that if there was some sort of repair work that needed to be done, you knew which wheel went back on the wagon on which side. And then also having the serial number of the wagon, again, we've got it stamped on here. It's also on the wheels themselves. If you had somebody in a workshop working on three or four wagons at once, they would be able to get the proper wheel back on the proper wagon on the proper side. So this was an interesting detail that we had no idea about uh, because this, again, this entire area through here was covered in uh, yellow and, and or gold and brown paint. So let's get back here to the, the dead rat. Well, keep in mind that when you were on your tour through Yellowstone National Park, your tour was being given by your wagon driver. And so not only did he have to uh, speak above the the rolling of the wheels, the sounds of the horses and things, he also had to, his voice had to combat against the sounds that the wagon itself was making. And when these wagons were made, they were made at a much more humid area, in a much more humid climate, uh, much closer to sea level. And by the time they had been up in the Yellowstone area, the wood would have started to shrink. And so you would have ended up having a lot of really squeaky wagons rolling through Yellowstone National Park. Now, if you look here, what this dead rat looking thing is, is actually sheep's wool that has been attached with a leather strap around this joint here near the front of the wagon. And I believe that the reason this has been put on there is, to, is there, this is an attempt that was made to stop the squeaking of the wagon so that the wagon driver wouldn't have to compete with the sounds the wagon was making as he gave his tour. And if you look right there, you can see where another one of these sheep's wool and leather pads were attached right there. There's one around the, that joint right there. You can see it's worn its way down into the wood. And then you can see another one on this side that it looks like has had the same thing happen, but that wool and leather pad seems to have fallen off a long time ago. And if you look at some of the other joints on the front of the wagon, you can see the same kind of treatment would have taken place there at some point. But this is this particular one right here is the only one that remains out of all the ones that would have covered the front of the wagon at, some, at one point in time. So there you have it. This is, the, this is the State Museum's Yellowstone wagon. I would be willing to say that this particular wagon probably has more of its original paint job left uh, than any other wagon of its type in the United States. And again, I mentioned, as I mentioned, there were over a hundred of these running on Yellowstone roads on any given day back during the tourist wagon trade of the, from the mid 1800s, from the mid 1890s up until 1916. But today there are just a handful of these left. Uh, a lot of them made their way to dude ranches, but most were eventually destroyed. I, I want to say that there are somewhere around two dozen of them left in total. I could be a little bit off on that. There, are, there is an organization that tracks that, but uh, we're very proud of our wagon here at the Wyoming State Museum. There you can see a little bit more of the, the pinstriping that somebody would have been looking at 100 years and a couple of decades ago as they made their way through Yellowstone National Park. But the, museum, the Wyoming State Museum is very proud of its wagon. Uh, it has been, you know, a lot of the seat cushions, of course, are reproductions based on original plans for the padded cushions that came with the wagon when it first left the factory. The canopy up above, the metal work is original, but the canopy itself, of course, has been replaced. But as I said, it's a great wagon. It's a really interesting piece of history, and it gives a bit of history of an area that most people don't think about uh, touring Yellowstone National Park prior to the arrival of the automobile. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this look at the Wyoming State Museum's Yellowstone Wagon. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. I'd love to discuss it with you. It's something that I, I really enjoy doing. That's all I have for you at the moment. Hopefully, we'll talk to you again soon.